my name is Haran Singaraja. I'm a RF system engineer with Allen Vanguard Wireless. Today we're we'll talking a little bit about the challenges of filling in the gap between low power and high power small cells. We're not quite femto, we're not quite macro, right in between there's a niche area where a lot of people are facing challenges and we like to share a little bit of what we found, what we've learned and how we can help in the future. So just a bit of a background about the company itself, like uh, we, we're striving to apply the most advanced RF technologies and software um, to increase spectral efficiency and performance, reducing size, weight, and the power consumption for existing small cells. We're focusing on instantly deployable small cell solutions, fixed wireless, private cellular networks, and uh, again, uh, small cells in general marketplace. So, small cells usually we expect them to be in the range of 1 milliwatt to 20 milliwatts, even 100 milliwatts. And usually when you're at low power, you can get away with a lot. Small components, highly efficient, low power, whatnot. When you start getting into very high power macros, we face a lot of challenges, but you're usually not, you don't have the same constraints that a small cell would have, and not the same constraints that, that, that are being used in, um, that you'd face in rapidly deployable scenarios. With high power, you get high power consumption. You also have a lot of heat dissipated. So there's a very strong need to be very efficient. With very, very high power scenarios and macros, you can usually see around 10 to 20% of efficiency overall. But we need to get that number up to 40% for it to be effective in the market. As you start to go and find solutions for highly efficient PAs and hard front ends, you're gonna have a lot of consequences unwanted emissions, data corruption, failure to meet industry standards or regulatory bodies. I'll show you a couple of examples of what we're talking about here. For any RF engineer, this looks pretty common. We're gonna be transmitting in the center band. That's where we're allowed to transmit. Once you get above three or four watts, you'll start to get distortion products in your adjacent bands and start interfering with your neighbors. Obviously, that's not gonna be good for you or your any of your network deployments. You'll also fail 3GPP. A lot of regulatory bodies will frown upon you. So what do we have to do is, we have to make it look very nice and clean like this by cleaning up all the leakage, all the adjacent power leakage. Another challenge is with OFDM based systems, we have a very, very high peak to average power ratio. So again, for anybody who doesn't it's not too familiar with RF. What that means is if you were going to design a 5 watt radio that's do using an OFDM signal, you would need 50 watts to be able to go and characterize the signal properly. If you're designing a 10 watt radio, that means you'll need a 100 watt PA. That doesn't seem very efficient to me. And that's one of the biggest challenges with creating an LTE or OFDM based radio. There are ways to reduce the PAPR so that you can use effectively a higher power output. Higher power means bigger range. Higher power means more coverage. OFDM signals use a P have a PAPR of about 11.5. 11, 11 so what that means is, again, if you have a one watt radio, you would actually need you'll actually see peaks about 11.5 watts. If we can reduce that PAPR by about 3 dB. That means our average power is going to be able to go a little bit higher too. 3 dB of gain means a lot. It could mean getting 100 more users. It could mean going an extra 2-3 kilometers. But as a consequence of reducing the PAPR, we start to see degradation in our modulation. In an ideal scenario, we have the constellation diagram of a 64 qualm signal, which is with points clearly defined, 64 de de clearly defined points. As you start to apply PAPR reduction, this constellation gets corrupted. And ultimately, that means data corruption. We can still see a little bit of the constellation points. There's a little bit of noise. And in this extreme scenario, you wouldn't be able to distinguish one data point from another. And this is what we're trying to fix with some of our late breaking technology. So I. A few months ago, we were 
or for about a year ago now actually, we were approached by a customer that was interested in demoing a unique scenario where they had low power radios and wanted to be able to pump that up to higher power. But there was also a special use case where multiple radios are using the same deployment. Now there already exist technologies and solutions to linearize your PA, reduce spectral emissions, maintain data integrity, but being able to do that over multiple radios has been a challenge for many vendors. So we set up a field trial with them to use the 700 mega, 1700 megahertz radio band, which is a band three for LTE, and tested in the mid-band, nominal operating temperatures as a lab environment. And our test looks very similar to this. Our radio, the DUT, was sitting between a signal source and a signal analyzer to measure how effectively we could make our PA efficient, make the deployment clean, and without corrupting any data. Now what you'd see here is a, a spectrum of a 2G signal. It's very, very low bandwidth, it's about 200 kilohertz, using phase shift keying modulation. Now this is a modulation scheme that is very unique because it's a constant envelope, but our PA was designed for an OFDM-based radio. Even with that being said, we're still able to achieve a very, very low EVM with this constant envelope modulation scheme. UMTS has higher bandwidths, which is not quite as high as what we're used to, but we're still able to achieve good ACLR, and as you can see, adjacent channels are passing the specifications. The 3G modulation scheme, we're passing by a tremendous margin of 1%. The points on the constellation are clearly defined. And with our bread and butter, OFDM-based LTE signals. We have a very good margin on adjacent channels. No interference in any neighboring bands. And very cl clearly defined constellation points. The EVM spec is defined at 8% for this, and we're at 1%. Now to the interesting section is the field trial itself, which included three separate radios using RPA. Now there are some complexities involved with using multiple radios, multiple basebands, multiple channels. But at the antenna port, usually what's happened is a operator will set three separate radios, three separate PAs, and three separate antennas. In this scenario, we have a 10 watt power amplifier that's able to not only divide the power up over the three radio technologies, but also mitigate data corruption through EVM degradation, as well as in-band spectral emissions, the ACLR, with the same PA. So original field trial has a 5 megahertz 4G LTE signal, a 200 kilohertz 2G signal, and a 5 megahertz 3G signal, all coexisting in the same band while still maintaining low ACLR and a very, very low EVM on all radios. We're continuing to do these trust trials right now with further bands and further bandwidths. Some experimentation could be, for example, the spacing between multiple radios, perhaps 4G on the low end of the band, 2G at the high end. Some of those complexities will arise because we although we may be using a 5 megahertz bandwidth for the channel, we'll still need over 100 megahertz or even five times as much of the bandwidth to apply linearization technologies. But as with challenges, we still come up with innovative solutions and we're looking for more challenges that we can learn from and uh, hopefully come up with interesting uh, new scenarios in the small cell world. So if there's any questions from anybody in the audience, I'd be happy to answer them or talk to you more about our exploratory efforts at Booth 20. Thank you again for your time. My name is Heron and Alan Vanguard, we're at Booth 20. Enjoy the rest of the show.